Hello, and welcome to a special episode of Bios Frontier Science. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Omar Abudai and Jonathan Gutenberg, principal investigators in the Abu Ghut Lab at MIT and co-founders of Tome Biosciences. Jonathan, Omar, thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to kick things off uh, with just brief introductions. Omar, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is Omar. I uh, co-run a group with uh, Jonathan at MIT. Um, and yeah, we've been doing that now for about four years, working on new molecular technologies for gene editing and cell therapy and uh, even beyond uh, healthcare. And I'm Jonathan. Uh, it's somewhat correlated, or especially over the past, you know, decade or so, working on, you know, gene, cell, editing technologies, and general technologies uh, that, you know, can accelerate science. So, yeah, I'm very excited to chat about this today. And thank you again for joining us to do so. Before we dive in, we'd love to learn more uh, about your personal stories and the motivations that brought you to bio, and especially healthcare research. Um, what got you interested in bio and why gene editing? Maybe Jonathan, if you want to start this time. Sure. <laughs> um, so I grew up uh, actually in Maryland, DC suburb. So I had some access to the National Institutes of Health. Both my parents were doctors, physicians. Um, so I kind of grew up in a culture where you know medicine and health was front of mind. And my parents, you know, both took me to work and I got to see you know, what they did. My mom was an internist. My dad was a pediatric hemonc. Um, they actually both worked for the FDA afterwards. Um, but uh, it, you know, in, in working on kind of biotechnologies and medicine and looking at those sorts of things, um, sometimes you go through kind of this period where you have, I don't know about a crisis of faith, but you have to think about what do I want to work on and how do I choose among all the different areas to focus on diseases and subjects and basic biology? How do you actually uh, choose? Uh, and so I realized actually during my senior year of high school, I was working at the NIH on um, an RNA interference screen uh, at the NCI to determine factors involved in ovarian cancer. And I thought, oh, this is really cool technology. And it kind of started to click to me a realization that kind of, you know, has been realized many, many times before that understanding and developing technologies is a wonderful way, not to only focus on one area, but to disseminate the capability to accelerate research across the board. Um, and, you know, it's really amazing to be able to kind of to have that raise all those boats in that sense. So when I came to MIT, I was wanted to do biological engineering, you know, cutting edge technologies. And I actually went through a couple of different technologies, mass spectrometry, uh, microscopy uh, with Ed Boyden. But I, um, my senior year, I actually was looking for some uh, electives and there was a class, this was in 2013. Uh, there was a class taught by Feng Zhang. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. You're, you know, I, I shot me well, how you, the physical paper just come out. I'm super excited. Uh, can I get in on the class? It was like right after the deadline. And he said, yes, like, oh man, it's gonna be super oversubscribed. It was me and two other students at Fong. So <laughs> it was like this really cool opportunity to kind of like, you know, learn from somebody who had built amazing tools, optogenetics, tailings, and then at that point it was working on CRISPR um, and, and see how you could use these not only for, you know, basic research, but also for therapeutics. And a really interesting thing about, you know, Fung's history and, and those sorts of molecular tools is that they've taken from culture or borrowed or stolen, depending on, you know, what you want to say, but where so learning about a system, like, for example, with CRISPR, a really fascinating bacterial adaptive immune system can teach us about that system, can teach us about how to build a tool for basic research and can teach us about a tool with translational applications and diagnostics or therapeutics. So, I think that was kind of the point where I realized this is really awesome, building these technologies. And CRISPR itself was, I think, one of kind of this, you know, not the first, but one of the first technologies where we really could see their impact and that they were really, you know, programmable in a sense, where, you know, you can program this enzyme to go to, you know, a stretch of letters in a three billion letter genome, uh, human genome, uh, to actually have an effect. So. That's really where I think I got this taste for programmable technologies, technologies inspired by nature and dri driven by nature and things that can have impact across the board. So 
that, you know, when we were starting our lab together, that's really what drove me, not just to gene editing or cell engineering, but, you know, programmability, drawing from natural diversity, you know, reprogramming these things and, and really engineering them. So that was, um, you know, a really fun kind of introduction and getting into this sort of, you know, work, which has been super fun. That's uh, an incredible background. And I loved hearing a little bit more of the personal, personal motivations, but also some of what, um, drove you to bring together these technologies along the way. Omar, would love to hear more of your story as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think I didn't originally, you know, want to go into study molecular and protein engineering. Um, I think, you know, growing up, I grew up in a household of engineers. So, you know, my, both my parents were engineers, my mom's electrical engineer, my dad's a civil engineer. So I, you know, literally grew up like you know my dad had bridge design software on his computer where i would like design different bridge trusses and like see if uh, it could carry like a semi truck load and it would collapse and you'd be like oh they're not going to the drawing board um or like making concrete canoes that have to float in water um stuff like that and so you know i, I found like tinkering really exciting you know i found you know problem solving and you know designing things and trying to bring them into reality really cool but it didn't satisfying because I didn't feel like it was the cutting edge. I always had this like thing I wanted to be like at the bleeding edge of like new innovation. And uh and so, you know, I went to MIT for undergrad and uh you know I was thinking about what I wanted to do and it seemed like you know healthcare and medicine was really, you know, kind of in it, having an exciting uh, renaissance, like you know, the late 90s or 2000s, you know, the first human genome was sequenced, people were sequencing new stuff every every year. Um, and it seemed like we were on the uh, sort of cusp of really being able to understand like how mutations cause disease and, you know, having understanding of, you know, now that you know these things, can you go and engineer them and fix them? Um, and so for me, uh, you know, I couldn't decide if I wanted to be a doctor or actually do research in this space. So like I ended up being indecisive and choosing both and went to MD PhD programs, uh, started at Harvard and uh, did my first year in med school and then was trying to figure out what lab to join. And, you know, at the time, Fung had just published this Cas9 paper in science showing like there's this enzyme and you can literally program it to target any sequence in the genome. And to me, it was like what I was searching for, like this idea of engineering, but like in a space that is like just so new and open and so little is known and it's like literally like the mi microscopic like you're literally rearranging atoms but in a way that's programmable um on dna and so i for me i felt like it merged like what i wanted which is like an engineering framework but in a space that um you know had so uh, so much to do and had such huge impact right like being able to save lives or actually go beyond saving lives like or not necessarily beyond saving lives but go beyond healthcare like engineering plants to make them more resilient like make food sustainability a reality potentially even like engineer microbes to make climate change uh you know uh better and so just like to me that was fascinating it was so fascinating that i chose not to return to medical school um after my phd and uh chose to start a lab inside with jonathan and spin out some companies as well and sort of uh you know, that's, uh, you know, kind of where we've been now for four years, and I haven't looked back. Um, I think maybe, you know, in my 40s, maybe I'll, I'll regret not finishing med school, and maybe I'll be that adult that goes back, but I think for now, like, programming biology is such an exciting, such an exciting time. There's just, there's so many new protein systems to discover, so many things that need engineering, the renaissance of AI, um, being able to apply that to protein evolution and cell design and um, there's just like, there's so much to do. It's changing every year and it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And your research is certainly nothing if not looking ahead. So I actually, before we take a step forward, I'm just going to pause and say, I had no idea concrete could float as a, in the shape of a canoe. Uh, so thank you for <laughs> teaching me and probably a lot of us listening <laughs> something new. Um, but to, <laughs> to dive in a little bit further, uh, the stated goal of your lab is to combine natural biological discovery and molecular engineering to develop a suite of tools to manipulate DNA, RNA, and cellular states, a cellular engineering toolbox, if you will. So maybe before we dive deep, could you talk a little bit about how not only you came together to co-start this lab, but also tell us a little bit more, uh, just a brief overview of your research. Yeah, maybe I can do just a brief overview and Omar can tell the fun story of, you know, <laughs> kind of how we work together. But um, just, you know, think about how large projects have catalyzed research and the ability to do 
types of research. The human genome was 20 years ago, and it taught us so much about the genome. It taught us so much we didn't know. And that really enabled this revolution of genome editing, where now we know that there are causative variants that are directly responsible for genetic diseases. And so we can go in and change them. We can also test variants that are unknown significance. We can test what genes do. We can do screening for it in reverse genetics. So that's you know been an amazing resource. Now, what are the large projects that are occurring right now? Well, the advent of technologies such as single cell sequencing and spatial biology have really given us unprecedented resolution into disease development biology at the single cell level, at the level of the resolution of cells, kind of like this original biological unit. So I mean, when you think about that, how do you actually take that information and make therapies out of it? How do you take that information when you do a single cell experiment and see that there's these different cells? What is important or what is not important? So we think about all the different ways to manipulate, target, edit, deliver to, destroy, proliferate cells. And it's a very broad mandate. Conveniently for us, we're still genome and transcriptome engineers and DNA and RNA are still inside of cells. But really, it's how do you develop this next set of technologies that are programmable and allow you to program and target cell states both outside the body, inside of the body, um, to understand their function and to treat disease. Uh, so that's really what the cellular engineering toolbox means to us. Um, yeah, so, and then I guess Omar, you can tell uh, a little bit about how we came to this kind of arrangement and this pursuit. Yeah, I don't really know. I just woke up one day <laughs> and we were like in the same office all the time. Uh, no, but uh, uh, I think I like we both uh, unplanned ended up as uh, first year graduate students in Fung's lab. Um, I think we were both attracted to genome editing and you know programmability of biology um, from different paths, and uh, so we both you know ended up joining Fung's lab and. They didn't really work together at first. We were in the same office. Um, we we had our own projects, but you know we were kind of always in lab because it was it was such a fun time. By the way, in Fung's lab, like just everyone was always around. It was like a buzz. Like we just just like so much like projects and activity, and so it was, it was kind of a really fun time to be uh, be there. And we spent a lot of time in that office. And so I think even though we weren't working together, we would just like be like, hey, you see this paper? Like you know, what if you did this? Here's a cool idea for a project. And I think after like a year of doing that, we were like, we kind of wanted to really work together because we just like liked each other. We uh, had good brainstorming chemistry, um, and we ended up uh, getting attracted to this concept of you know what if there were other enzymes than Cas9 out there that could be useful. Um, everyone was so focused on Cas9, but um, you know just from conversations with like Eugene Kooning and Fung and you know, a lot of the mining people were doing, it seemed obvious, or not obvious, but it seemed very likely that there were probably other systems out there uh, other than Cas9 that uh, could be interesting to study. And so, um, you know, we collaborated with Eugene, he found all these interesting systems and, you know, Fung's lab, we characterized them. We found new DNA cutting enzymes, we found ones that cut RNA, we turned them into a lot of G uh, different DNA and RNA editing technologies, and even CRISPR diagnostics came out of that. Um, and so from this like one project, we kind of, had on the side, to be honest, because we had our other projects, it started uh, to start working and it became our dominant project. And then because there was so much to do building off of that, Jonathan and I literally like worked on everything together in grad school. I think we had like 10 papers together as first authors. Um, and at the end of that journey, we were like, what now? This has been so much fun. Like, how do we keep that momentum going? There was a lot of, you, you can imagine we spent so much time together. There were other things even outside of genome editing we were interested in doing. And so we actually told Fung, we were like, we really want to keep working together. It's, you know, we're like a good team. And of course, he, you know, he and other people are like, well, you know, you can't work together. It's academia. You have to, you know, be on your own and go through that misery of <laughs> finding your own path. Uh, but luckily, actually, Fung really saw the potential of our partnership. And there have been other, you know, joint labs in the past. And we were lucky to be able to find out Nick Govern was starting a fellows program and they were actually quite supportive of us doing it together. Um, so we applied to that and were able to get it. And um, that's how we ended up here now. And, you know, obviously we're thinking about our next steps as faculty members and um, applying for that. And once again, it's kind of those things like, can we continue to bend the framework of academia and find a way to keep this close, uh, you know, collaboration and partnership going, so.
No, I was going to say it's I, I'm not very familiar with co-PI structures. And so it seems like you're doing something at least relatively unique. Uh, how has that worked out so far? I mean, clearly it's going well. Uh, it seems like you bring both, as you mentioned, Omar, different backgrounds and different skill sets. But if you're brainstorming together well, it seems like you're in a position to design and execute on really cool projects. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you think about on the industry side, you know, you normally have you know, a founding team, co-founders, you have somebody coming in with a technical background, a non-technical background. And part of that is, you know, people bring synergies, right? You know, you have someone who has experience like, you know, in drug development and somebody who has experience like a new kind of technical, like a modality and they can like, you know, brainstorm. That's part of it, but also, you know, just building stuff and doing things that are at you know they're hard it can be difficult and taxing and it's i think important to have somebody who you can brainstorm with who you can help co-manage who you can like work through problems with and so it's interesting that in academia it's more rare because you see a lot of these challenges in academia where it's like how do i think about this project how do i explore this new area how do i manage this thing in the lab where in industry, you would have an executive leadership team, you know, multiple co-founders who would be able to talk through it and get aligned and set culture. So that's, I think, part of the inspiration that we take where, uh, you know, industry, you know, has things to teach us, uh, many things, I would say. Um, but one of them is that sometimes you can go farther together as a, a group um, to solve challenging problems. No, very well said. And hopefully, and maybe fingers crossed, we'll see it become a more consistent framework for academia to model off of in the future. But for now, to talk about and dive deeper into your research uh, with our first topic in novel genomic molecular tools, I'm going to pass it over to our wonderful co-host, Claudia Hill. Claudia? Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks so much for that, um, Omar and Jonathan. It was amazing to hear your a bit more about your backgrounds. Um, and I feel a lot of similarities in, in my path because I was an engineer and then moved into bioengineering um, as well. So I, I just wanted to kind of maybe give a bit of background for our audience who might not be as biologically um, savvy. And one of the key things that your lab lab does is, is kind of, as you said before, takes inspiration from nature. And one of those um, that, that we've talked about is CRISPR systems, which look at bacterial systems and how that and then using that to revolutionize biotechnology um we'd love to hear a bit more about how you're looking at bacterial systems um in a slightly different way and what techniques your lab is creating to create the new molecular tools that you're creating so um to kick things off um can you describe what bacterial systems biology is yeah so um you know, bacteria <laughs> uh, have a lot of uh, proteins as uh, human cells and other eukaryotic organisms do, um, but uh, there's a huge diversity of bacteria. Uh, and, you know, with how easy it is to sequence these things, there's now this treasure trove of genomic and metagenomic information and, you know, so many proteins and protein systems that are in that mm -hmm. data um, a lot of which people don't know exactly uh, what they do or haven't been characterized. You can almost call it like the dark matter um, of bacteria, um, where I don't know what percent uh, exactly, but it's probably like 98 or 99 percent of these proteins haven't been studied. Um, and so when we talk about like mining new systems and studying how they work, um, that's what we're talking about, which is like you computationally search for protein domains of interest and um, pull their low, low side from the bacteria, study them in the lab, figure out how they work. And um, if they're useful, you can maybe even turn them into technologies. Um, but uh, there's just there's just so many functions that have been uh, evolved naturally in bacteria that um, that's why a lot of people look there from, you know, things not only for gene editing enzymes, but uh, proteins that can degrade plastic, right? Proteins mm -hmm. that can maybe be useful for actual mining, proteins that can be useful for making materials, uh, you know, fibers and plastics and, um, you know, even for cleaning enzymes, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things can can come from these organisms. So uh, it's definitely an interesting space to work in. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. 
what would you describe are the kind of key wins um, from your work and others' work uh, in the field? And what do you think remains the key challenges that would lead to the field's advancement? Yeah. So, I mean, depending on how broadly you define, like, kind of, you know, taking these bacterial systems, characterizing them, and, you know, turning them into, you know, tools, understanding them. I mean, the key wins are pretty much like basically all of biotechnology as we see it right now, where you think, you no, know, if you're in the lab and you're doing things like, you know, using a polymerase, a DNA polymerase, an RNA polymerase, a ligase, uh, you know, these are things, uh, restriction and nucleases, these are things that have come from the study of bacterial systems, right? These are all from bacteria. And with the exception of that uh, DNA polymerase, which you often come with PCR, um, for example, often come with these thermophilic bacteria, which are really cool. Um, and also it's nice to mine extremophile biology, but like the RNA polymerases that were used to make the RNA vaccines, for example, restriction endonucleases, which come from, you know, bacterial defense, ligase, which come from phage. These things are actually not only coming from, you know, just bacteria in general, but this I battle between bacteria and the phages and other mobile elements that try to take advantage of them. Um, and another one of those is CRISPR, right? This uh, adaptive bacterial immune system that is fighting off mobile elements and, and you know, bacterial viruses. Um, so we've learned so much about these systems, which have also taught us about basic biology, right? You know, studying the uh, bacterial regulation of uh, you know, transcription with you know, like Jacob and Minot, like taught us basically everything we know about how genes are expressed. But, you know, a lot of the actual foundational biotechnological tools come from these systems. But, you know, it's crazy, like what's, you know, what are, remains to be unsolved. I mean, we're still really only scratching the surface here where those things I discussed before, like, you know, phage, ligases, polymerases, restriction of nucleases, those came from kind of studying like model organisms where, you know, okay, we get a bacteria from, you know, wastewater or like, you know, E. coli and figure out what invades it. So small examples. Now we can do much more large scale metagenomic sequencing, but we really still don't know what's out there. And mm -hmm. there's these massive bio mining and bio panning efforts to just sequence diversity and we'll find totally new things. And that's what will happen. I mean, it's when we go in and look at CRISPR diversity, for example, you know, every year there's more sequences in these databases and every year we find more and more systems and more and more interest in biology. So uh, it, we don't know what's out there, but there are of course many challenges to be solved. Omar mentioned concretely like enzymes that degrade plastic. Um, mm. You know, those were found, you know, different, you know, pet degrading enzymes, for example, were found by sequencing you know, places that, that was being thrown away. And so all the challenges that could be solved by biotechnology that currently aren't, and you can imagine so many of them, you know, it, I would say with fairly good confidence, either will find them in natural, like bacterial or maybe eukaryotic diversity, or we'll be able to like, you know, generate them using some machine learning approach, but that's a whole other spiel. But so yeah, it's, it's a wide open frontier still. And we just don't know what's out there and we're optimistic. Amazing. So one of the key technologies um, developed from your lab, which was uh, which I certainly found uh, very exciting to read about, um, is PACE or programmable addition via site specific targeting elements. Can you tell us a bit more about PACE? Like, how does it work and what does it enable? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when we were starting our lab, we, you know, well, we had a lot of non genome editing things we were interested in. We still wanted to keep doing, you know, some, some work in gene editing to still solve some of their main challenges. And I think one of the things that was bugging us was this notion of, you know, it's really expensive and hard to, you know, make gene editing drugs. Like it's hard to make a drug in general, but a gene editing drug, like that's another beast. It's a new class of molecule. Also, you're seeing like the price tag of these things, right? Like two, three million dollars. So um you know if you look if you go into the sort of clinvar which is this database of all known like genetic variants right there's like billion not sorry not billions, millions like two three million variants that are known to be likely pathogenic or pathogenic 
Um, which means that if you're going to go and treat each mutation by mutation, you're going to be making a lot of gene editing drugs, which is honestly like impossible. Um, and if you look at most diseases, most diseases are not a single mutation. There are dozens, if not hundreds um, of mutations. And cystic fibrosis is more than 2,000 mutations. Um, and so it's not really practical to make these really precise uh, mutation correcting uh, technologies. Like, you know, there's first gen CRISPR, there's base editing, prime editing. They all suffer from this challenge even though they're really great technologies. So we, you know, we're kind of thinking like, what would make much more sense is if you actually replace an entire gene. Because um, if you replace a gene, it doesn't matter what mutation the person has, you're, it's a single drug that applies for all the diversity of variants in, in the patient population. So, you know, the challenge is first-gen CRISPR can be used for a gene insertion and replacement using repair pathways like homology-directed repair and autologous end joining. Um, but these repair pathways are not, very active in you know humans or non-dividing cells in um, most tissues, um, and if they are active, like non-dividing cell joining, they create a lot of like bad edits, like what we call indels, which are breaks in the DNA. Um, and those can actually be more than the actual insertion event. Um, so there's a lot of issues with those approaches, and so you know we were trying to think how could we actually do this enzymatically, so you don't have to rely on these typical DNA repair pathways. And one of the ways that has been a holy grail for a while is using integrases or transposases. Um, and integrases are really great because they're really active. Like these serine integrases like the XB1 are awesome, but they're they're hard to reprogram. They have these very small target sites that they like to insert at like 30 to 40, 50 base pairs. Um, but what we realized at the time was there was you know this advancement called prime editing, which works well, but can't insert things much larger than 50 base pairs. Um, and so we were thinking like, it would be really great if there was a way to merge these two approaches into something that could work. And so we actually realized you could fuse the Cas9 reverse transcriptase that makes up the prime editor with the integrase like BXB1 to make one system that could come in that would insert the small landing site via the Cas9 RT into the genome. And then the integrase would then insert into that. And integrase can insert like a large payload, it's like tens of thousands of base pairs. And the paper, I think we show up to 36,000 base pairs. So um, you know, we actually took us a while to get this working. There were things other than BXB1 integrates that we tried first that didn't work that well. We eventually landed on BXB1. So I don't want to get into the nitty gritty, but it actually took a while to get this working. When it did work, it was like, holy cow, it like works pretty well. And, you know, we've continued to optimize the system. I think we've seen data for 60, 70, 80% efficiency now in cell lines. And, um, you know, we were thinking, you know, how can we actually translate this? Because I think we think that programmable gene integration is really the final solution to really uh, curing a lot of diseases. Um, and we were really interested in how do we like push this forward. And so, um, you know, now we're trying to explore how to translate it and maybe make it into a drug one day. Yeah, awesome. It's it's interesting because like as a, as a fellow scientist, you know, I, you know, you know what it's like when you've tried multiple different things in the lab and finally getting the thing that works. And then obviously you publish as if it was the first thing that you tried. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I'd be interested to hear more about that, maybe maybe offline. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so so talking a bit more about how, how you can, you're gonna use this to kind of cure diseases or having an impact in patients. Where do you see this PACE technology having the greatest impact in patients? Are there any specific indications that you think may have a, a best fit? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And best is hard, but we can explain some of the things that we're working on in the lab and thinking about. And it really comes down to, you know, in vivo and ex vivo. Uh, or I would say to bridge that differently, you know, correction of genetic mutation as well as cell therapies, which can be done in vivo or ex vivo. So for correction of mutations, uh, one area we're actively working on is in cystic fibrosis. Um, actually, we have a very um, nice collaboration with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, you know, CF is a, a disease that has actually been, been amaz amazing uh, efforts there with the modulated therapies, but, you know, those don't treat all disease uh, mutations and it, manifestations of the disease. Um, there are over 1,700 different mutations in cystic fibrosis, you know, in the CFTR gene that can manifest in CF. Um, and so you can't treat all those with small molecules right now. You can't even treat all of those with other approaches for genome editing, such as base editing or prime editing. So 
the concept is that if we can actually just drop in this CFTR gene at the CFTR locus, then we can treat that. And so we're actively exploring that. Other things is areas where delivery is easier, of course, to the liver um, is an area of intense interest for us. There's many different diseases uh, where we can actually drop in genes to cure those. And then on the ex vivo or in vivo cell therapy side, um, cell therapies are becoming more and more complex to manufacture, to actually have in terms of the sequence, which is great, you know, because you have the, your CAR T's, for example, with different bells and whistles that make them safer, that make them more effective, less prone to exhaustion. But being able to actually integrate that sequence in, in especially in specific places to make very specific, you know, drug products um, is challenging. And it's been shown, for example, if you put a CAR in the T cell, the T receptor locus, um, that can make it much more effective in the track locus. So being able to do those sorts of things, I think will, you know, have a large impact on cell therapies as well. So we're very excited about those and uh, pushing those forward. So that's where we think, uh, but the nice thing about these technologies is in certain ways, we don't know the impact. We have inbound for collaborations and we have multiple different collaborations in these spaces and others going, but the plasmids mm -hmm. are available on AdGene. People can pick them up and, and try out using the, the technology on their uh, disease or model of choice. So um, sometimes we don't even know uh, when a publication will be coming out that uses paste. So we're excited to see how the community uh, uses it, how they build upon it and make it better, um, and how these other technologies all kind of rise and continue to develop. I think that's one of the really exciting thing about being kind of in the developing tools space is that you can kind of see how is being used by labs in the community and you're kind of getting constant feedback in in, in a way. Um, so we've obviously talked about like it's you know, there's numerous potential applications um, and the translation of this for for patient um, impact. We'd love to talk a little bit more about translating. Um, what do you think are some of the key challenges uh, that need to be overcome to see this be successful in the clinic? I would say probably delivery, I would think is probably the most substantial thing. I think um, making sure, you know, we can deliver the components to the right cell types. It's, it's multiple components, right? You have to deliver the actual protein editor. You have to mm -hmm. deliver the two guide RNAs plus the DNA template. And I think RNA delivery is really easy. And so showing that we can do RNA delivery of the protein editor plus the synthetic guides um, to actually, you know, uh, get those components into cells is one thing. But then we also have to deliver the DNA template. Um, and, you know, there aren't as great solutions for DNA. Like RNA, very easy. You mix in a lipid, inject it in vivo, and it goes. But we're likely going to have to do, you know, an LMP for those plus an AEV for the DNA template. So it's gonna, probably going to be a mixed product, right? And like figuring out, um, you know, how do we, you know, deliver those things in vivo? Like people have tried these types of things in mice and, you know, you have to dose them together, you dose them separately. Mm. So I think figuring out like all the dynamics of those two pieces and um, how well it works and, you know, LMPs really only get into the liver right now. It's hard to get to other tissues. So how do we go beyond that? And how do we match that with AV capsids that go beyond that? I think it's, is uh, going to be the challenge there. Um, otherwise, you know, I think because we have less reliance on DNA repair, I think it's going to be probably easier to get these things to work in more diverse cell types. And even in our own hands, we've seen diverse cell types work. Um, but it's going to always come down to like, how do you deliver it? Is it expressing enough? Is the efficiency good enough um, to meet like a therapeutic threshold? Um, and that's, you know, we just have to try and optimize and, and we'll see. Yeah, it seems to kind of always come back to delivery. I'm, I'm, I, I'm a bit of a delivery nerd. That's what I did my research in and, and it had my early career in. Um, so I totally get that. And those are the problems that we are, well, there are lots of companies and academics now looking looking to try and solve. It's a, it's a big area with, yeah, a big problem to solve. So, but with, with that context and kind of continuing in the vein of translation uh, of these early stage technologies, let's talk a little bit about some of your company creation work. Um, we'd love to understand a bit more about your motivation to expand from academia into industry. What was it that you kind of felt that you could do through startups that you weren't able to do via your lab? Uh, I mean, 
make drugs, like <laughs> make medicines. So, you, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort to make a medicine. Making medicines is really hard. I mean, and that this comes with, we, you know, Omar and I have never led to the creation of a proof drug. But of course, we have some experience, at least partially along the way. But yeah, you know, and if you think about everything that goes into making, let's say, a genome editing therapy, when you break it down, it's a very, very intensive process because you need to take a technology that has been demonstrated in the lab. Maybe that's in cells. Maybe that's in animals like mice. Maybe it's even in non-human primates. Um, but you need to be able to take that to be able to be rigorous enough with it to make sure that it works, that it works well, that it works well enough to have a phenotypic output that for the disease of interest and maybe figuring out what you know actual indication you're gonna pursue is also part of this process, um, that you can get something that would make sense in, in a model. Um, you need to be able to make sure that when it does that, in the case of, you know, it has no off targets, safety, in the case of gene editing, what, are, what is it actually doing to the genome? Um, and this is all in the background of being able to produce it in a way that is, you know, GMP, that we have large enough amounts for to run a large animal trial or to run a clinical trial, to be able to collect that data package, to then start that clinical trial, to file that IND, and then to actually run that clinical trial. I mean, this takes, you know, hundreds of people working full-time on that. And that is not something you find in academia um, because you just don't have the funding. The NIH is not going to give you, you know, $300 million to make a drug. There are certain examples of, you know, clinical hospitals being able to run clinical trials, but especially for, I think, new modalities like gene editing, you know, you just need that sort of funding and resourcing that planning, that experience that comes from, you know, not just two PIs, from the executive leadership team. Um, so it it really is the, the place to do it. But, you know, it's also not, you're not going to find an industry, a totally new technology really being developed that, you know, is accessible to the whole community, um, like academia, where we can kind of do, do more open research. So there's, you know, very different, uh, you know, goals in a way, you know, they, there's some question, but they do split. So I think when technologies reach that point where they can be translated, that's the time to start that translation process because it's very hard. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of resources to eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed, make a drug product. I think that's well said. And I think it also ties back to some of what you were describing earlier as we consider the delivery of these technologies and new gene delivery approaches. So as we think about this space, a key barrier to translation is often efficient and targeted in vivo delivery. So we'd love to learn more. You talked about this briefly, uh, about some of the interesting approaches you're taking to challenge and address this uh, delivery problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of the work we're doing is still early, but I think, um, you know, it really comes down to how can you retarget things to the right cell types and understanding uh, the mechanism of doing that. I think, you know, there's been a lot of work in the AAV field for enge uh, engineering protein interactions, right? Like engineering new capsids that have small changes in them so they recognize new receptors on cell surfaces. Um, I think that's been a, a very uh, good strategy. And I think doing more of that for more tissue types and more cell types is going to be uh, one of the ways we solve this, I think, uh, given, you know, some of the issues of AV, people have turned to LNPs and they're more challenging because you only have lipids. And it's like, how do you engineer a lipid to target, uh, new cell types? And so, you know, people have been doing some lipid screens. People have been trying to, you know, engineer interactions that way. In other places, adding antibodies on lipids to retarget them. I think, you know, John Epstein from, uh, UPenn had a paper on this where they could retarget T cells by adding an antibody like uh, targeting moiety on their LMPs. So I think those are interesting. Um, people have also looked at VLPs because you can put proteins on VLPs and you target them that way. Sana has done a lot of work in this space. I think you know, David, Lou, and Fong have also published recently on VLPs. So I think that's an interesting space. I think we've also been trying to understand both from bacteria and eukaryotes, are there VLP-like uh, uh, things that we can mine and uncover and uh, engineer? And I think that's one thrust of the lab that's definitely uh, up and coming and hopefully we'll have uh, stuff to talk about that in the future. 
and we're excited to bring you back on when you're ready. Um, okay. And as we think about this, especially when it comes to novel delivery, delivery mechanisms that are inspired by natural biology, one of the major challenges is often the scalability of manufacturing. So we'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the scalability of some of these techniques you're exploring with recognition, again, that this is early stage work. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to think about how complex something is when you are developing it, um, but also to balance that with, you know, how do you actually do it? So for example, paste is many different components and, you know, thinking about how you would package it, I don't want to say it like as an LNP with multiple mRNAs, potential multiple guides, you know, with an, a template, maybe as an AAV, there's difficulties there. So how do you simplify that? Maybe how do you reduce the number of components needed? How do you change whether it could use, you know, DNA or RNA as a template, for example? Um, there's a lot of considerations we think about. And then, you know, we even think about at the very far end, like, you know, how do we just make it AVs easier to manufacture? Are there ways to scale that up? You know, how do you make DNA easier to manufacture or RNA? So there's many different applications of, this, of you know, engineering of proteins and kind of doing direct evolution or mining natural biology mm -hmm. to improve the manufacturing process. Um, but yeah, I mean, any time that you really need to build a tool, you know, if you have like 16 different components, that's probably going to be pretty impossible to manufacture. Um, so I think you can always push the kind of envelope a little bit. I mean, concretely, right, Intelli is working on a, de, you know, delivering an LNP and an AAV together for, you know, different applications for gene insertion. And, you know, that's probably at the moment one of the more, more complex approaches that's ever been tried, but it's it only becomes, in some cases, more and more complex. But it's, it's possible. And I think, you know, these things will see, you know, novel ways to make it easier. And as the precedent gets set, the bar will come lower. Um, and there'll be more manufacturing capabilities and more expertise to be able to do that. Well, maybe before we come to a close, we can ask a few rapid fire questions just to cap things up. I guess, first and foremost, uh, do you have any advice for researchers who are seeking to translate their work from academia to industry? Omar, do you want to start? It is a good question. I mean, I would say, you know, uh, there's a saying, uh, I think you go fast alone, but together you go further, or <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think for, especially for me and Jonathan, we get caught up in this, like, you know, you no know, competition and like, you know, you have to publish and get stuff out quick. And, you know, it's almost sometimes feels like a race, but um, I feel like, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's really, it's really, you know, the work is really as only as good as the people around it. And um, you really can't do that much on your own. And so I think, especially with a company, like if you're going to make a drug, you're probably going to need hundreds of people at the end of the day, like to, to actually come together. And so I think, you know, really making sure, you know, it's not just about getting the science and translating it, but almost thinking about like, what's that organization that you're going to build? What's it going to look like? Like, how are you going to attract those people? What's the story you're telling? What's the culture going to be? What are the systems in place? Uh, to, you know, so everyone feels included or everyone feels, you know, happy and they're contributing. Like, as organizations grow, like, it's really easy for information and communication to, like, break down, right? And mm -hmm. so um, I think, like, putting a lot of time into who you're recruiting and who you're working with is really, I think, what makes or break a uh, company. And I think that even goes back, even before you hire the first employees, like, your investors, who you're working with, like, matter a lot. Like, you know, what's their commitment to their companies? Like, you know, what's their philosophy on company building? Like when the market gets tough, like right now, are they going to put more money up to make sure their company survive? Or are they going to be like, oh, sorry, we're pulling the plug. Um, I think, uh, so like really thinking about who you bring around the table. Cause like, I don't know, when we did our first thing, it's like, you don't really think about that at all. But, uh, you know, now working on like, I think our fifth company, it's like that those are the things that matter a lot because decisions you make, when someone's involved, they're involved and it's like, those decisions can really affect you years down the road. So um, I would say like the science is really a small part of building a company that's going to make a drug and thinking through uh, that is important. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I would say definitely, you know, about bringing people around the table, like, yeah, look for, you know, good people. Like Omar said, I think mentors can be very, very helpful in thinking through it's, you know, it's a long path to, you know, make uh you know something a product a service something that's tangible which is you know 
the goal, it's important to remember that's your goal. You, you don't start a company just to do cool science because you need to eventually make money to sustain yourself. You know, your investors will earn a return. So there are different ways to do that, but it's important to remember you need to be able to do that. And it's it can be very different for a first-time entrepreneur. So finding people who understand that landscape, who know what that means can be very helpful. Um, I mean, and, and kind of in that vein, you want to think things through. I mean, you, you can have a cool idea and you can, you can say, I thought this through, it's going to go from, you know, A to B. But you have to think about once you're at B, you know, thinking through your value inflection points um, and actually with, you know, A and B, like thinking about your raises, you know, what are the things you're going to generate? How are you going to take this enormous trajectory and break it down into digestible parts? What does that look like in terms of strategy, in terms of, you know, the building of your organization, in terms of how much money you're spending, um, in terms of who you have to talk to, uh, to partner for specific components or maybe for PD deals. So thinking things through is critical. And like Omar said, uh, you know, you slowing down to think them through um, can be very good. It also means that you might not be burning cash, you know, spinning, going in a circle. So, you know, just, you want to have thought things all the way to the end and you don't have to have be perfect, but if there are gaps in that, figure out those gaps and figure out how you're going to address those gaps and learn how to solve those gaps rather than just kind of like gloss over them and kind of say, oh, we'll, we'll figure it out. So that is critical because without that, you know, you will reach a point where you have no idea what to do and that's painful. Speaking of thinking and looking ahead, it's often said that people overestimate what they can do in a few months to a year and underestimate what they can do in, let's say, five to 10. In five to 10 years, what is your vision for the gene editing space? Where are we with the cellular engineering toolbox? Maybe just in a few sentences, because yeah. I know we could go on for another hour. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, you say a few years? Yeah. Or... <laughs> just, just a few years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a few years, I think... Uh, if you, want long... to 20, yeah. if you want to say 2050, we can say 2050. Yeah, yeah. So in the order of a couple of decades, I, mean, I would hope we're making substantially, there's 7,000 genetic diseases. I would hope that we're actually making progress on curing a bunch of them with a lot of these next generation programmable gene editing tools. I would say it's probably hard to imagine that we would have cured all 7,000 genetic diseases, although that is the goal of what we're doing, right? Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, but... <laughs> You know, I think we're on the cusp of some of the earliest, uh, you know, human uh, tri uh, trials actually reaching a, a potential new drug for these, right? And sickle cell disease, maybe you know, Talia has uh, the amyloidosis drug they're working on. So, you know, in 20 years, maybe maybe 100, maybe a few hundred, right? Maybe things accelerate. Like, you know, the first gen CRISPR companies really laid out the groundwork about how to build these drugs, how to do the manufacturing. Um, and the next gen companies get to build on that, right? And things accelerate things faster. So, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see uh, where we are in costs. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if the cost of these gene therapies in 20 years is only like $10,000, like the cost of a biologic, not like $2 million. Um, and can we get there maybe by um, one, doing a lot of this stuff directly in vivo and having no ex vivo components and two, just by, you know, maybe new innovations in biomanufacturing. So I think we can talk about biomanufacturing at all today, but um, I think that's a really interesting space for uh, folks like us and it's something we we are working on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Delivery, I think, is going to be something that people are focusing on right? and they've seen it be done. And so we're going to get a lot more movement in that space and that'll unlock a lot of stuff. So that'll be really exciting to see. If we have a, if you have a second, we'd love to hear your thoughts. I uh, wasn't trying to gloss over it on, on biomanufacturing. Um, you want to start, Omar? No, go for it. I mean, you know, it, it takes a lot to make, you know, an A, B, for example. <laughs> you know, it, the cost of goods is, you know, often, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Where is that coming from? The CapEx and the OpEx of that. And can, you know, interesting biological solutions and immune solutions, making better GMP DNA, making many more virus per uh, viral particle per, you know, cell per DNA, making sure those particles are better, more filled capsids. This is just one concrete example. Um, and making them potentially more potent so you let fewer uh, viral particles per patient. Um, these are all innovations where, you know, understanding the basic biology of it, 
understanding, you know, kind of where we can engineer it and, and kind of come in with natural approaches, with engineered, uh, protein engineering approaches, um, can all make substantial differences. Um, because these things are still, you know, as complicated and as te cool technology they are, still a little fashion, you know, we're putting DNA into cells or spitting out virus, we can assemble the virus in vitro um, with purified mm -hmm. protein. So there's going to be many different approaches to this. Um, and not only one will win, there'll be a handful of winners. Uh, and this will make things more accessible, uh, you know, reduce the cost burden, thankfully, which you've seen for things like antibodies that have gotten cheaper. They used to be, you know, only select, you know, diseases that can be treated because they're so expensive. Um, it'll come to these new approaches as well. So uh, that, that will be exciting. I would strongly agree. And I think it's something that I think, as you're talking about, especially costs, we're all hoping for. So before we before we come to a close, any other closing thoughts, shameless plugs? <laughs> How can the audience learn more about your work? Shameless plugs. Uh, <laughs> we're always hiring. Uh, you know, we, we love to, to work with people. So uh, definitely reach out if interested. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's definitely an exciting time to be in biology, uh, especially harnessing things that exist in nature and making them better using direct evolution and making technologies out of them is just such a fun process. So uh, yeah, hopefully we can inspire more people that come do that with us. Love that. All right. Uh, thank you, Omar, Jonathan, for an absolutely incredible episode. Can't wait to come back in a few years, a few months time and hear <laughs> about all your incredible progress. We're very grateful for your time and thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much.